Hi, I'm Tonya White, and today I want to speak once more about the blast of the shofar. Last time we spoke about the idea of the shofar as echoing a sense of wholeness and brokenness, moving from the tikiya to the trua, to the shvarim, to the shevel, to the brokenness, and coming back to a tikiya to a deep sense of wholeness after having gone through fragmentation. There's a fascinating Gemara in Rosh Hashanah 33b that discusses how the Torah should sound. And they speak about the idea of a yebava, a whale, what kind of whale it should be, should it be broken, should it be whole. And in discussing it, they bring in a very interesting image. And that is the image of the mother of Sisra. Sisra, one of the arch enemies of the people of Israel that we read about during the time of Dvorah the Shofetet, Dvorah the judge in the book of Judges. And she really, we, we the, the rabbis bring her and use her wail, use her wailing in the Psukim, in the verses, Tibavev, it says she wailed when she found out, or when she believed or thought that her son had gone missing, had, had been killed even though she was not sure. And the biggest question is, why bring the imagery of the mother of one of the greatest, one of the most cruel enemies of the people of Israel? As we know, the Gemara, the Talmud, is one of the earliest sources, really, of Jewish theology. And I believe that there's a deep fundamental message in bringing the cries of the mother of our arch enemy into our consciousness at the time, at this time of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. What they were doing, the rabbis, was conveying an extremely powerful message message, that there is a certain universality, a certain commonality of suffering, of the suffering of a mother for their child, when a mother is suffering because of their child or because they've lost their child or because their child is going through something terrible. It's a suffering that in a sense transcends names, it transcends identities, it's that cry, that human cry why don't the rabbis, I asked myself, why don't they bring Sarah as an example? Sarah and the Akedah. And the answer is because I think there's something about M. Sisra that they want her image to be in our minds when we listen to the Shofar, that her image has, in a sense, a monopoly on our conscience, on our consciousness, on our consciousness. If we look at Dvorah, Dvorah's song, Dvorah the Shofeta, the judge, in the book of Shoftim, in chapter 5, she describes herself as a mother of Israel, as the mother of Israel, Aim by Israel. And it's the same language that also she describes Sisra as a mother, as an M, Sisra. Like in the Gemara, in a way, she's making a parallel between two very different mothers. She describes the mother of Sisra waiting for him and looking, literally peeking through the latticed windows. We, the reader, we know already that he's dead. We know that he was killed by Yael with a pent peg, uh, with a tent peg, but she, she doesn't. She doesn't know. And in a sense, there's, uh, Viva Zombo beautifully describes it as a kind of, um, vertigo, right? She's left in that liminal space, the space of not knowing, the mode of uncertainty, the mode of unfinished conclusions. In a way, that's the place we're in now. This 10 days of repentance is that liminal space. It's the space between two realities, between the year that was and the year that's going to come, between the Xera, the decree of the year that, that has been, and the decree of the year that's going to be. And it's during this period that we feel uncertain. We feel the not knowing. We feel that we are in this unfinished conclusion, this unfinished space. And perhaps that is the most painful place to be. And we, when we listen to the shofar, we have to be in that place, even if it means identifying with our arch enemy's mother. We think about people in that space. Those are the people we need to have deep, deep empathy for. Agunot, in a liminal space, a place of not knowing, not here, not there, missing in in action soldiers. It's a no space, a space between two certainties and two realities. And it's definitely the worst place to be. And in many ways, even though Sarah's cries are in fact mentioned, they're mentioned in a very different source, not in the Gemara, not in the Talmud, they're mentioned in a very early homiletical source, in a Midrash called Perketa Rabbi Eliezer. And there, they talk about her crying a hundred cries. And they talk about the idea 
that she cries these cries because she believes or she thinks or she has a intuition that Yitzchak has been sacrificed, but she doesn't know for certain. And in a way, she dies because she cannot hope, she cannot hold that uncertainty. Sarah, we know, is a woman of black and white. She very much is someone who sees exactly what needs to be done in every situation, and she makes clean cut, sometimes very brutal decisions. Unlike Avraham, she's somebody who can't hold the grey zone, and therefore she can't hold that zone of not knowing. Perhaps listening to the cries of Sarah, listening to the cries of M. Sisra, two very, very different one women, two very different people, one who was a righteous woman and one who was most certainly an evil woman. There's a subversive message here about something universal to all of humanity, and that is the notion of empathy. That is the notion that we must empathize even with people who are so different and unlike ourselves, even with people who wish bad upon us. We need to arouse on this day, the day of judgment, on Yom Shoshanah, on Yom Kippur, both of these figures through Blast and the Shofar, both Sarah and M. Sisra. Both of these women at some point in their stories have lost empathy for the other. M. Sisra, we know, sees the women and, and even describes her, her son, who she really wants to believe is alive, as looting and raping women, seeing women as an it, seeing women as an object. She is comforted by that image. She is not in distress by the suffering of others. Sarah, even Sarah, at some point denigrates Hagar and Yishmael, and the Farshim very much criticize her for that. She treats them also as an object. She treats them also as someone and doesn't have sympathy or empathy towards them. And yet these two women are worlds apart. And so what is this telling us? That even the greatest of all people, even Sarai Menu, the person that we look up to and that we are in awe of and have reverence for, even Sarai Menu at some point, being human, can lose a sense of empathy. We all, even the most evil and the most great, greatest people, have moments when they lose the universal sense of ethics. And it reminds us, the Shofar, of our responsibility to live between these worlds, to live by the black and white, the world of the command, the world of having to do things pragmatically, making the right decisions, but also sometimes, even when those decisions are hard. For example, uh, Yaakov taking the bracha from Esav, and we hear of Esav's cry, and it is a great and mighty cry. The, 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 the Torah goes to lengths to tell us how great the cry of, of Esav is. Why? Why do we need to have sympathy? Because even sometimes when we are doing the right thing, even when we think or we know or we believe that it is the right thing, it should never, ever negate our deep sense of empathy for the other. In a sense, Devora, a woman, uses her power of womanhood, her power of the rechem, of, of being a woman, to, get, to show rachamim, to show compassion. And therefore, on Rosh Hashanah, we need to hear the sounds of the Shofar. We need to awaken ourselves to the cries of Sarah and M. Sisra. We need to know that in this moment of uncertainty, in this liminal space, we need to remember that we have to move through the unknown and the uncertainty. And the way to do that is through empathy. To take it one step further, very often as moral beings, we're faced with moral dilemmas that are uncertain and unknown. We're not sure how to proceed. We're not sure what the right thing to do. We don't know which value should champion the other. But I think the answer is that no matter what path we choose and no matter what decisions we make, the one thing we must never, ever lose sight of is the empathy for the other is the universal ethic. And even if we've caused the other to suffer because we know we have to survive, like Yaakov, like Aim Sisra, like Dvora, we must understand that we can never lose sense of looking and seeing the suffering of the other, even if at times we may not be able to remedy and even if at times we may have caused that suffering because that empathy, that compassion, that's what makes us like God. That is where the Tzalem Elohim is. That is what makes us human. The Shofar reminds us 
of our call to being human. We are sometimes stuck in the space between two values to never, ever forget that empathy is the supreme value overall.